I'd like to uh, thank the program organizers for inviting me to speak as part of the session this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank a couple of my colleagues back at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Lindell Gentry, who's been one of my mentors for the last eight years, and then also one of the ENT residents, Ian uh, Kozuski, uh, who helped me with some of the surgical um, images. So by the end of the talk today, uh, I've got a, a several different, let's adjust this microphone here. I have three primary objectives for the talk today. By the end, I'm hoping that you'll be able to identify the relevant anatomy of the sinonasal cavity. You'll be able to review a sinus CT examination using a systematic approach and identify some key anatomic landmarks and variants that are going to be very helpful for our surgical colleagues to know uh, before doing functional endoscopic sinus surgery. <coughs> So the sinonasal cavity has a number of different functions. Of course, the, uh, the paranasal sinuses and the sinonasal cavity primarily filter uh, the air that we breathe. So essentially filters all of the, the debris and the pollen, et cetera, uh, as we inhale the air. It also humidifies the air so that it can warm the air before it goes down to the lungs. Of course, very important for olfaction. And then it also helps to decrease the overall weight of the skull. And then uh, it also allows uh, us to essentially have a crumple zone. So if we are involved in, a, in an accident, uh, the perinasal sinuses essentially will protect the intracranial cavity. So the sinonasal cavity is lined by respiratory pseudostratified epithelium. And it's composed of four different types of cells, ciliated and non-ciliated uh, columnar cells, basal cells, and goblet cells. And together, uh, they attach to the bone and form the mucoperiosteum. Now, the cilia essentially beat in uh, the direction towards the ostea uh, through the paranasal sinuses. And so these cells produce mucus and uh, uh, produce about one liter of uh, mucus uh, per day. And this mucus uh, traps the particles. And that function can be compromised when it's inflamed, particularly when you have uh, a situation where the cilia are not functioning normally, uh, or um, if there's a lot of mucus that essentially affects the cilia. So as in this example, we can see here that the uh, maxillary sinuses are chronically opacified. We have thickening of the osseous walls of the maxillary sinus uh, in this patient with cystic fibrosis. So when we're evaluating patients that have a CT examination of the sinuses, it's really important to understand who is ordering the test and why are they ordering the test. Because it will help you try to tailor your examination so that you're, you, you can make sure that you're identifying some uh, important structures for those referring clinicians. So when is it appropriate to actually image? Now, the ACR just came out with a revised guideline in 2017 that essentially uh, gives us uh, some guidelines on uh, appropriateness of imaging in the setting of evaluating the paranasal sinuses. So what about in the acute situation? If somebody presents with less than four weeks of symptoms, is it appropriate to image? Uh, and based on these guidelines, we can see here that it is not appropriate to image in that acute setting uh, if it's an uncomplicated situation. Because as we all know, sinusitis is, an, um, is a clinical diagnosis. And so our referring clinicians are making that diagnosis. They don't need imaging to confirm the diagnosis. So when is it actually appropriate to image? Well, it's really actually in the situation where you have patients that are coming back with chronic sinus inflammation or multiple bouts of acute sinus inflammation. And so in that situation, we're really looking for an anatomic explanation that can help us understand why is the patient actually coming back with recurrent symptoms. And in that situation, our workhorse is a CT scan without contrast. And then if we look at variant three, essentially if somebody's coming in with acute symptoms, but it's a complicated situation. So you're worried about intraorbital or intracranial extension, then it is appropriate to image in the acute scenario. Uh, but that's in the complicated um, patient. And so in that scenario, essentially we're going to be imaging with MR, with, with and without contrast, um, of the sinuses of the head, and potentially we could consider doing a CT scan with contrast to look for those, um, uh, the extension of disease beyond the margins of the sinus. Uh, 
So when we talk about protocols, essentially our workhorse that we're going to be looking at these scans every day are the CT scans without contrast uh, of the paranasal sinuses. So we do thin uh, images um, that are in the axial, sagittal, and coronal plane in both bone and soft tissue algorithm. It's really important to have some soft tissue windows so that you can really uh, do a good job looking at the adjacent regional anatomy beyond the sinuses. It's not just enough to take a look at the sinuses themselves. So we're obviously working in, uh, in parallel with our surgeons, our uh, surgeons who are doing functional endoscopic sinus surgery. They are using our images in the OR uh, to help guide their surgical approach. They are essentially looking in through an endoscope, and their view is very different from our view. So it's really important when we're looking at the CT scans that we can identify certain structures, certain anatomic landmarks that are going to be helpful for them in, uh, in doing their functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So before a surgeon does um, surgery, they're looking for certain things on the CT scans. They will review all of their CT scans on all of their patients prior to uh, 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 FES. So they want to look at the relationship of the unsnip process to the lamina papricia. They're looking at for orbital dehiscence. They want to identify the sagittal slope of the skull base. They also want to take a look at the depth of the olfactory grooves. They're looking for accessory cells, so these accessory pneumatized air cells, as well as the location of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries. So understanding what they're looking for can help us actually tailor our report so that we can make sure that we're identifying all of those things that are important to them. So we use uh, structured reporting uh, at UW, and we have a, essentially a template that really helps uh, guide us and our residents and fellows to make sure that we're uh, reporting on everything that's going to be important to them. So we'll first describe any surgical changes. Um, we'll look at the nasal cavity and the turbinates, look at each one of the sinuses independently, look at the drainage pathways, uh, anatomic variants, corner shots, and then of course we want to take a look at the teeth. So let's start off uh, with the nasal cavity. We're essentially going to move um, from the outside in. Now we have um, the nasal bones here, which are sort of these small parallelograms um, that essentially uh, anchor the cartilaginous part of the nose. The nasal bone is, uh, uh, attaches to the maxillary bone by the na nasomaxillary suture laterally and then by the nasofrontal suture um, superiorly. If we look at our axial images, uh, axial and sagittal reconstructions, we can see here our nasal ala uh, is, forms that sort of outer uh, cartilaginous portion of the nose. We can see our nares. And then the opening into the nasal cavity is referred to as the piriform aperture uh, that opens up into the vestibule. Now that posterior part of the nasal cavity uh, separates, is separated from the nasopharynx by the coena. And the nasal cavity is divided uh, into two different compartments by the nasal septum. The nasal septum, we can see here, is also made up of cartilage and bone. So anteriorly, we have the cartilaginous part portion of the nasal septum, and posteriorly, we have the osseous part that's made up of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid superiorly and the vomer inferiorly. Now that vomer uh, attaches to the hard palate at the level of the maxilla and the palatine bone. The anterior part of that, um, that hard palate is referred to as the anterior nasal spine. So if we take a, a line just right at the, the level of the osseous nasal septum and we look at our coronal plane, we can see we're profiling the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid superiorly and the vomer inferiorly. So that superior part of the nasal septum attaches to the anterior skull base, uh, and it attaches to the horizontal lamella of the cribriform plate. We also can see that the, uh, there is a, a vertical lamella of the cribriform plate, and together uh, these make up the cribriform plate. The roof of the ethmoid sinus is referred to as the phobia ethmoidalis, uh, and it's really important to take a look at this anatomic structure uh, because this is very important for the surgeons to take a look at that anatomy. Uh, they will look at this on every patient because understanding that anatomy can help minimize um, uh, their production of potentially causing a CSF leak. Uh, 
So we can see here just below the horizontal lamella of the cribriform plate, we've got the olfactory cleft. This is also a very important anatomic structure because identifying soft tissue in this area in somebody that does not have a lot of sinus disease, we have to think about anesthesioneuroblastoma, and I'm sure that we're going to hear about that uh, in our next talk. Above the cribriform plate, we've got the olfactory fossa. And the olfactory fossa is divided into two different compartments by the cristigalli. And together, essentially, that trough, the olfactory fossa, uh, cradles the, um, the olfactory nerve. So we essentially have the olfactory nerve fibers that travel and connect between the nasal cavity. They pierce through the cribriform plate, which is fenestrated, and um, it forms the olfactory bulb that essentially sits uh, within the olfactory fossa. So understanding this anatomy, as I mentioned, is very important. Uh, and there is a classification, uh, as there is in most things in radiology, right? So understanding uh, this classification, um, if you use this terminology, um, your surgeons may uh, find that beneficial. We can see here that um, the Kiros classification is divided into three different types, type 1, 2, and 3, essentially just based on the depth of the olfactory fossa. Now what I find actually a little bit more useful is understanding the relative asymmetry between the right and left side. And that's something that the surgeons really find helpful. If the, um, if the fovea ethmoidalis is more obliquely oriented on one side, if one is lower than the opposite side, uh, that's something that we um, will identify and put in our reports. So along the lateral nasal cavity, that's where we have the terminates. And um, for the most part, we're essentially talking about the superior, middle, and inferior terminate. And occasionally, you might see a supreme terminate, uh, but that's relatively uncommon. So looking at our coronal view here, we can see our inferior, middle, and superior turbinate. And on the undersurface of the turbinates, we have the inferior, middle, and superior meatus, respectively. Now, in our endoscopic view here, we can see our nasal septum um, at the midline, uh, and then we're profiling the inferior turbinate more proximally, and then in the distance, the middle turbinate. So the middle turbinate turns out to be a very important landmark for the, sur uh, for the surgeons. They use this um, uh, and will identify the middle turbinate because oftentimes they'll take it down in the setting of functional endoscopic sinus surgery. It may be contributing to some narrowing um, of the uh, drainage pathway. And so essentially understanding the attachments of the middle turbinate is important. So we can see here that the middle turbinate has a couple of different attachments. Superiorly, uh, that vertical attachment attaches to the cribriform plate. So you can imagine if the surgeon is going in endoscopically and tugging on that middle turbinate, they may cause a CSF leak. And so understanding that anatomy is obviously going to be important. Now the horizontal uh, basal or ground lamella of the middle turbinate essentially has this horizontal swing, and it attaches to the lamina propria. That basal or ground lamella is uh, important anatomically because it divides the anterior and posterior ethmoid air cells into two different compartments, and they have different drainage pathways. And then that posterior um, part of the middle turbinate attaches to uh, the maxillary sinus. So you can have a couple of, um, you can have anatomic compromise of the nasal cavity, and that can be congenital or developmental. Um, this is just a, an example of a congenital um, uh, uh, cause of uh, anatomic compromise of the nasal cavity. This is piriform aperture stenosis. Essentially, it's just stenosis of the piriform aperture. And um, it's stenotic if that uh, distance here measures less than 11 millimeters in term infants. When you see this finding, essentially, you want to take a look to see if you have associated findings. And oftentimes, you'll see this uh, prominent central median incisor. You can also have um, anatomic uh, compromise related to septal deviation. So you want to essentially identify if the nasal septum is deviated one side or the other. You want to see if there's a septal spur that contacts one of the turbinates. Um, so essentially, you want to identify, is the septum deviated off midline? You can also see septal perforation. And um, essentially, you can identify if the nasal septum is uh, perforated involving the cartilaginous part of the nasal septum or involving both the osseous and the cartilaginous portion. 
Now, septal uh, perforation can be caused by a number of different um, uh, uh, entities, surgery, trauma, granulomatous disease, um, cocaine, decongestant nasal sprays, as well as neoplasm. So a lot of different causes uh, that can cause septal perforation. So now moving on to the paranasal sinuses. Now, of course, paranasal sinuses are a complex unit of four paired air-filled cavities at the entrance of the upper airway. Each is named after the skull, skull bone in which it is uh, located. And so we're going to essentially take a tour. Now, in terms of development, the uh, maxillary sinus is the first sinus to develop in utero. Uh, and at birth, you'll start to see uh, the air cells within the ethmoid cavity as well as the maxillary sinus. Um, this is a five-month-old child. You can see just some very small rudimentary sphenoid sinuses. Um, at six years of age, that's when we start to see um, more pneumatization within the sphenoid and um, more adult-like pneumatization within the maxillary and the ethmoid sinuses. Frontal sinus is beginning to pneumatize around this time, and we can see it uh, certainly progresses as the child develops through adolescence and through teenage years. So the maxillary sinus is the largest and most constant of the paranasal sinuses. The anterior wall essentially makes that, uh, that anterior surface of the maxilla. Uh, the posterior wall is, separate, is separated essentially um, from the maxillary sinus, and laterally we can see the infratemporal fossa and medially the pterygopalatine fossa. The medial wall opens up into the nasal cavity here. We have a couple of different named recesses within the maxillary sinus. So if you have a lesion within this part of the maxillary sinus, you can say that you have a lesion within the alveolar recess of the maxillary sinus. If it's um, more lateral and superior in location, you can say that it's in the zygomatic recess. Or if it's posterior, you can say that it's in the palatine recess. The ethmoid air cells are the most compartmentalized of the sinuses, and it's divided into the anterior and posterior by the ground lamella. And so we've mentioned this before, um, but essentially, uh, to reiterate this point, we've got that middle turbinate that divides the anterior and posterior ethmoid air cells into two different compartments. Why is that important? Because they have different drainage pathways, and we'll get to that uh, in a couple slides. Another important anatomic uh, landmark is the lamina propria, and we know that the lamina propria is paper thin, uh, and we can uh, understand why if you have a patient that has significant disease within the ethmoid air cells, because that bone is so thin uh, that that disease can uh, easily extend into the adjacent orbit. The frontal sinus is, of course, located within the frontal bone. It typically develops asymmetrically, and it's separated by this intersinus septum. The posterior border is, of course, the anterior cranial fossa, and the inferior border is the orbital roof. The sphenoid sinus is located at the skull base at the junction between the anterior uh, and middle cranial fossa. These two sinuses also tend to develop asymmetrically, so it's not uncommon for one sinus to be smaller than the other, one uh, to be relatively hypoplastic. Um, the roof of the sphenoid sinus is referred to as the planum sphenoid alley, and the posterior superior border is the cella turcica here. So some uh, important anatomic uh, variations here that are important to uh, just take a look at when you're evaluating the sphenoid sinuses. Um, here we can see that this intersinus septum attaches to the carotid canal. That would be important for the surgeons to know um, for obvious reasons. You've got the carotid arteries just underneath, and so if they happen to be going through the sphenoid sinus, maybe they're going back to the cella, they should know uh, the relationship of that intersinus septum to the carotid. The sphenoid sinus has variable pneumatization. Uh, it could, uh, you could essentially have no pneumatization where the, the sphenoid bone is entirely osseous. You could have partial pneumatization of that sphenoid um, or complete pneumatization of the sphenoid. And that, of course, also has a classification. We would describe this um, uh, type as conchal, this as precellar, where the sphenoid sinus essentially stops at the anterior face of the cella. Uh, and then the cellar type is where the entire sphenoid is pneumatized and it surrounds the cella. This is a, a situation where you may encounter um, in your clinical practice where you get referred um, this case by one of your uh, ENT colleagues. They say, oh, this patient was transferred in to evaluate for a sphenoid sinus lesion. Uh, 
you can take a look here and you can see that there's an obvious abnormality or it looks like an abnormality um, within that left sphenoid. We can see here that the right sphenoid is normally pneumatized, but when you throw some Hounsfield units on that, you can see that it measures minus 23. So this is just a normal anatomic variation. This is arrested pneumatization. So it's not uncommon for one of the sphenoid sinuses to maybe not develop quite as much as the other. Uh, so don't mistake this for pathology. So the drainage, essentially, it's important to have a, uh, an understanding of the paranasal sinus drainage uh, because if you identify pathology within the sinuses, you have to trace it back to see is there some sort of anatomic compromise at the drainage pathway that can help the surgeon to target that area. So the osteomedial unit is the common drainage pathway of the maxillary sinus, the frontal sinus, and the anterior ethmoid air cells. We can see here that the, uh, the cilia essentially are beating towards that natural ostium. One of the most important anatomic landmarks for the surgeon is identifying the uncinate process. And that uncinate process is that sort of superior projection uh, from that medial maxillary sinus wall. Surgeons will target that area and take that area down um, to essentially widen the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus to create a maxillary antrostomy. So how do they do it? Well, they go in endoscopically and they essentially put their uh, tool behind the uncinate. They clamp down and so they actually are not able to see around the, the corner of the uncinate. So what's going to be important for them to understand? Well, they want to know what's medial to the uncinate. Is that uncinate process just right up towards the, um, the, the medial orbital wall? Because you can imagine if they're putting their tool just around here, they could very easily inadvertently go right into the orbit, and that's happened. So the ostium is that opening of the maxillary sinus, and then it uh, leads into the infundibulum, which is sort of a chimney um, that is just lateral to the uncinate process. And then around the uncinate, you've got the hiatus semilunaris here. The frontal sinus and the anterior ethmoid air cells essentially drain uh, into that hiatus semilunaris, and then ultimately into the middle meatus. So you can see accessory uh, ostea within the maxillary sinus, and you'll see them as small little openings um, within that medial maxillary sinus wall. They're often posterior um, uh, and inferior with respect to the natural OMU. The frontal sinus drainage, uh, essentially we'll see this, um, this channel. Uh, I, I always like to profile it best on my sagittal reconstruction, and then if for some reason I can't see it, I'll take a look at my coronal, and for the most part, you'll be able to identify it on uh, these two reconstructions. So the frontal recess sort of looks like a funnel, um, and that leads right into um, uh, the middle meatus. So it passes over the agronazi cell, which is a pneumatized air cell uh, within the lacrimal bone. Um, and then it drains right into the hiatus semilunaris and then eventually into the middle meatus. The sphenoethmoidal recess, that drains all of the stuff that's posterior. And so what are we talking about here? Well, that's the posterior ethmoid air cells, the sphenoid sinus, um, which both collectively will join in, drain into the sphenoethmoidal recess. So on our axial images, we can see that opening uh, nicely within the sphenoid uh, sinuses. This is the sphenoid ostium, and that drains right into that sphenoethmoidal recess. We'll often see the posterior ethmoid air cell that will uh, eventually join into that sphenoethmoidal recess as well. And both both of these, uh, that sphenoethmoidal recess, will drain into the superior meatus. So if we see here, in this patient, we've got opacification of the maxillary sinus, the anterior ethmoid air cells, as well as the frontal sinus, we would describe that as an osteomedial unit pattern of obstruction, right? Because all of those sinuses drain into the osteomedial unit. Noticeably, though, we can see that the posterior ethmoid air cells and the sphenoid sinus look clean. So that's not unexpected, right? So we are uh, really going to be targeting our um, search, uh, and the surgeon is really going to be targeting the osteomedial unit to see if they can open up that area uh, uh, to facilitate drainage in this patient. We can see in this patient we've got opacification within the left maxillary sinus. Notice how much smaller that left maxillary sinus is. We have atelectasis of the maxillary sinus. Where is the uncinate process? We can see it very well on the right side, but where's the uncinate on the left? We can see it's laterally deviated, so much so that it looks like it's co-opted to the orbital floor. 
We can also see that the orbital floor is actually inferior uh, in position. And if we actually take a look at the position of the globes, we can identify that this left globe has relative inophthalmos when compared to the right. So the constellation of all of these findings, uh, we're going to be thinking about silent sinus syndrome. And that is essentially um, related to this chronically opacified and atelectatic sinus related to chronic obstruction at the level of the infundibulum. Other things that can cause uh, osteomedial unit pattern um, of, of obstruction, essentially if you have large ethmoid air cells, uh, these ethmoid bullar cells, they can cause uh, narrowing of the, um, the infundibulum. We can actually see this unsinate actually has this horizontal uh, positioning, which is sort of interesting. So it's also important to take a look at some anatomic variants. Uh, these are uh, can be surgically um, corrected if, if, if they need to be, uh, but it's essentially just understanding various structures in the paranasal sinuses that can be pneumatized. And so you'll often see these accessory cells or uh, structures that are pneumatized. Uh, so this is a situation here. We've got pneumatization of the middle turbinates or contrabullosa. Here we've got pneumatization of the vertical lamella of the turbinates. That's referred to as a concha lamella. Here we have pneumatization of the uncinate process. Um, so this is an uncinate cell. Pneumatization of the cristigalli. This uh, air cell we've seen before already, the agronazi cell, which is pneumatization of the lacrimal bone. And um, it, it's important to identify and to describe this, especially if it's large and if it's causing compromise or narrowing of the frontal recess. You'll often see um, some additional air cells that are, are above the agronazi cell, and those are referred to as frontal infundibular cells. And you'll describe them in relation to the orbital roof and the agronazi cell. So a type, one, um, agar, uh, a type 1 infundibular cell is one cell above the agronazi cell. Uh, a type 2 infundibular cell is two cells. A type 3 is a cell that essentially spans the ethmoid sinus and extends into the frontal sinus. And a type 4 is an isolated uh, frontal sinus air cell. Here we can see um, there's, it's not uncommon to see air cells extra pneumatization of the ethmoid that extend beyond the margins of the ethmoid. So this is a situation where we have uh, an ethmoid air cell, but it's in the maxillary sinus and it's along the orbital floor. So this is referred to as a, a Haller cell, uh, and these can often cause compromise of the osteomedial unit. Here is a very important air cell. We can see here we have an extra ethmoid air cell, but it's above the sphenoid sinus. Um, so this is referred to as an onodi cell. Uh, it's a posterior ethmoid air cell that extends above the sphenoid. Another important one, we can see that there's pneumatization of the anterior clinoid process and the optic strut. Uh, obviously important uh, because of the relationship with the optic nerve, which is just medial to it. Another important one, we've got uh, pneumatization of the pterygoid recess, essentially, which is just pneumatization beyond the margin of the foramen rotundum and the vidian canal. Um, and we can see the association with the pterygoid plates. Why is this one important? Well, we can see if you have isolated sphenoid sinus mucosal thickening or opacification, you want to look at the integrity of the sphenoid sinus to see if you have a potential defect, as we have in this patient. A small little uh, defect that uh, can be a predisposition to uh, meningocele or encephalocele. Lamina propitia dehiscence is a very important one. We can see here that we've got a very large uh, defect within the lamina propitia with uh, medial extension of, of orbital fat, um, actually causing compromise of the OMU. Another patient with a lamina propitia defect. Now, we described this one, uh, but despite our best efforts, um, this pa the patient uh, at surgery actually, unfortunately, had a CSF leak, and they got into the orbit. And then a couple of uh, corner shots just to finish off here. Um, really important to take a look at your soft tissue windows to make sure that you're looking for incidental findings and then um, other regional uh, uh, structures. So this is a 63-year-old who had a remote history of trauma. Uh, we can see this repair for a ZMC fracture. Make sure that you look at the brain. Uh, we identified this round structure here along the course of the M1 segment, uh, which was confirmed to be an aneurysm.
One other important um, finding is when you're looking at these patients that have sinus disease, it's really important to look at regional anatomy. So we obviously have opacification of the maxillary sinus. Um, take a look at your soft tissues and we can see some infiltration of the retroantral fat. Take a look at your brain and we can see that there's low attenuation within the anterior and inferior frontal lobe with a small focus of gas. This patient went on to have an MR, and we can see the obvious um, complications of sinusitis, cerebritis with meningitis. So today we've essentially gone through this whirlwind tour of sinonasal anatomy. Um, really important to take a look at your um, how you're reporting these findings. I would encourage you to use a template uh, to allow you to make sure that you're seeing everything that you should see. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to now identify the relevant anatomy, review sinus CT examinations using this templated reporting, and then identify key anatomic variants. Thank you so much.